Hi, my name is Phil Howard. Welcome to this installment of the Media and Change series. My guest today is Gillian York from the EFF. Welcome. Welcome to Budapest. Yeah, thank you for having me. So there are many things we could talk about. Uh, let's start with Germany, where you're based. Um, Europe has seen quite a few interesting um, internet policy changes over the last year or two. Most recently, the right to forget. Um, how is the right to forget being taken by German th think tanks, the people who work for mm. internet freedoms? Sure. I mean, I think it's it's interesting coming from an American perspective on this because my organization, as you probably know, disagrees strongly with the implementation, at least, um, and probably the concept as well. I think I'm personally of more of a mixed mind on the concept. Um, but in Germany, it's generally lauded. Um, it's seen mm. as more privacy focused than around the removal of speech. Um, and so while I'm, I kind of view it within the censorship paradigm, in Germany, it's it's really kind of a, a matter of being able to control your personal data. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's forced corporations to move quickly to try to catch up and comply and figure out how to implement, right? The implementation, the guidance on the implementation didn't come from the court. Yeah, no, and the implementation seems kind of messy. I mean, I think it's, it's really troubling to me um, that, uh, particularly with Google, I'm less confident on um, how it's being implemented with other companies or if. Mm -hmm. um, but with Google, I think that, um, it's, it's really problematic that there's a reliance on Google to make these determinations, that they've had to hire paralegals to do this. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't seem to me that that should be the role of a corporation in this. Um, and so I think that, uh, again, it's, it's the problems are really 75% uh, with the implementation. And then you know, there are, of course, concerns about the ruling. But I think reasonable minds can disagree on, on whether that's a good thing. That was a good thing. I think I agree with you on the, purport, the proportions of the way I, I feel, <laughs> yeah. how I feel about the right to forget. Um, but I also think it's nice that every once in a while there's a public policy instruction that reminds firms that they need to be responsive. So isn't that one of the good things that at least Google uh, realized they need to be attentive to what legislators and courts and public opinion says about their work? I would say yes and no. I mean, I think particularly it's good that they're reminded that they need to be attentive to Europe. Mm. Um, I think that in the U.S. they're already quite attentive to what politicians want. Um, you know, they obviously they they donate to both sides um, of the of, of the, the uh, political divide. Mm. They're you know sort of very active in lobbying Congress, um, and so it is nice for once for them to listen to uh, the needs of another country mm. or countries in this case. So that's interesting. <laughs> that's almost. Uh, that's almost a commentary on how on the political system in the U.S. Do you think the tech firms are closer to the politicians they work with in the U.S. than they are to politicians in Europe? Is that oh, absolutely? Yeah. I mean, I think that in the U.S. they have a vested interest in making sure that both sides are happy mm -hmm. um, when it comes to things like the net neutrality rulings that are happening now. For example, um, there's been bipartisan support mm -hmm. for that and bipartisan opposition, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's partly because of the lobbying that happens from these companies. I think that um, sometimes you know this can result uh, this can have good results, but m more than that, I think that it's it's kind of a sign of of um, how decayed the U.S. political system has become that Google can have that much control. So it's not something for Europe to aspire to. to no. Closer, <laughs> closer ties between politicians and technology firms. Yeah, right. no, no. Okay, then has the ruling made uh, other technology, IT firms, uh, more sensitive or more responsive in other domains, like even even areas in which uh, that aren't affected by the right to, uh, or right to forget? Mm. Um, are corporate are corporations more responsive? You know, that's a good question that I'm so. not sure that I have an answer to specifically from that. But what I can say is that um, with and the, the debate right now around what companies should be responsible for in terms of terrorist content, um, mm -hmm. particularly with uh, ISIS or Islamic State, um, I think that that has definitely made companies more responsive. There have mm -hmm. been a lot of um, meetings in the EU uh, with government officials and companies like Twitter and Facebook and Google. Um, that's happening in the US as well with this um, summit that happened last week. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how good of a thing that is either, um, what role that they should play and what role the governments want them to play and how that's being done as sort of a, um, a backdoor deal rather than through mm -hmm. legislation. Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, I, mean, I, I would say that there is kind of an increase, particularly in Europe, of companies having dialogue with politicians mm -hmm. and, and governments. And uh, what would you think is the best format for that kind of dialogue? It, 
more industry associations, something like the uh, Global Networking Initiative, more direct contact between firms and governments? I mean, how, how do you better coordinate a response to ISIS and a guarantee of free speech? I think it needs to be done within the constructs of the rule of law. So the mm -hmm. problem that I have with this is that uh, you essentially have governments telling companies um, to censor. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this before. The State Department famously in 2012, or, or the White House as far as I understand, um, called up Google or YouTube in the hopes that they would take down that pesky Innocence of Muslims video. Mm -hmm. And instead of doing that, YouTube kind of compromised by, by blocking it in Egypt and Libya, which mm -hmm. I thought was incredibly paternalistic of them. Um, and so I think that, you know, the when when a when a government can just call up a company and get them to do whatever they want, what does that say for democracy? What does that say for the role of corporations and the role of capitalism in in our democracies? Um, and so I, I do think that it's problematic. I mean, I think that groups like GNI can have a positive role in that, but they need to be more transparent. I haven't seen that from them. Mm -hmm. Are there other groups that do it better? Are, are there other ways of bringing transparency to the system? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, you know, a, a group like the Global Network Initiative is always going to be compromised in some way because their funding comes from companies, and that's mm -hmm. transparent, of course. That's mm -hmm. no secret. Um, and so they're they're really you know their role is to work with the companies and not against them. They can't be oppositional. It's it's just not in their nature, and that makes sense. Um, I think that it really takes kind of outside watchdog kind of groups to mm -hmm. push that. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to toot EFF's horn in this particular context, um, although I think that you know our, our Who Has Your Back report, for example, is a good way of pushing companies mm -hmm. on some of this stuff. Um, but you know, Rebecca McKinnon's Ranking Digital Rights Project, um, I'm working on another project coming up soon on this. And I, I, think you, I think really the pressure has to come from the outside to keep these companies transparent and accountable. Mm -hmm. That said, the one credit I will really give to GNI on this is um, I think that they've played a big role in pushing the companies to do transparency reports. Mm -hmm. um, and while I'm not happy with all of those transparency reports. They're not fully consistent. They're not, yeah, across, they're not uh, consistent. Yeah. Um, and I'm not even sure that they're honest sometimes. Mm. But I don't think that that's the fault of GNI. I think yeah. that's the fault of the companies. Right. Yeah, I think it, it obviously takes a, a many different kinds of actors to keep mm -hmm. many different kinds of actors honest. Um, there are only a few groups like EFF, right? And we could probably count them on one or two hands. Mm. Uh, CDT, perhaps, and Privacy International. Uh, you, you could never say that there's an EFF-like group in every country. No, but I think there's more and more. So um, they, you know, they're not on scale. I mean, I think EFF and CDT, Access, uh, Privacy International, they're all international groups. They mm -hmm. all work in a number of different countries, and that's, I think, what sets them apart and makes them unique. Mm -hmm. So there's a handful more. Um, but I think there's there's been kind of a, a growth in certain parts of the world. I would say Europe, um, the Middle East, and Latin America, definitely. Um, of smaller, more nationally focused groups mm -hmm. on these issues. Mm -hmm. And so we have this in Germany, there's Die Gitarre Gesellschaft, they're a couple mm -hmm. years old. Yeah. Um, in the Middle East, I mean, I can, there's Smacks in Lebanon, Hebra in Jordan, um, yeah, yeah, groups yeah, yeah. that are doing all of this kind of work in that's their right. local context and connecting with those international organizations. And I think that that's a really good way of doing this. Right. Because EFF, for example, can never be the expert on every country. Mm -hmm. We have expertise on a handful of countries because of you know, people's interests. And, but without growing, um, you know, without growing at an incredible rate, mm -hmm. we would just never be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's really nice to have that sort of um, collaboration partnership with these local organizations that allows us to, you know, to both help them amplify their causes and give them sort of the c capacity sometimes to get things done. To get things done. I think that's one of the most exciting things about working in this space is yeah. that the, uh, this seems to be a, have become a civil society issue, something voters seem to want to be more literate about um, privacy and information access and there are now whole political parties that dedicate themselves to tackling intellectual property right, as an issue. Yeah. And 10, 15 years ago, I don't think we could have imagined that IP would drive elections. Yeah, no, do. it's it's it amazing. Yeah. It's amazing, and I think that there's something nice about that that structure too. In just to go back to that for a second, in that, um, you know, I think what we used to see was your sort of human rights watches mm -hmm. that um, act as sort of the moral, um, my moral barometer. I don't know what the right word is here, um, but really kind of a judgment Litmus for the whole world. Yeah, Litmus okay. test. Yeah, yeah, exactly, um, and that in this day and age, in the, in the type of activism that we're coming into, it 
it doesn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the wrong approach. I don't feel comfortable mm -hmm. going, I mean, yes, I might condemn what the Jordanian government is doing in terms of censoring websites because it's stupid and it's not productive, mm -hmm. um, but it's not my place to, to really work on that you know, from an American perspective. And so, but working with someone on that, standing in solidarity with a group there, I think mm -hmm. is a much more powerful statement, mm -hmm. um, both in terms of what we can help with and in terms of how, um, you know, how locals can accomplish things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that um, civil society groups that don't actively work on information mm. policy have had to because they get attacked now yeah. over information infrastructure. And so Human Rights Watch, um, Amnesty International, Greenpeace, they've all suffered denial of service attacks from mm -hmm. hostile governments. And so it's forced sort of, I think, civil society groups who work in other domains to start to get active on policy issues. Yeah, like yeah Greenpeace yeah. is such an interesting example too. I and mean, mm. we flew a blimp with them over the NSA um, mm. building in Utah. Ah. So they, they loaned us their blimp, um, mm -hmm. allowed us to paint it, and we had Greenpeace and EFF's logos up there and stopped right. spying on us. Right. And, right. Uh, and it was great. And it's just, it's so cool because this is not their, you know, it's not their issue area. Not it's not something, but this matters to everybody. Right, right. It, it must be, uh, so one of the nice things I imagine about operating in the U.S. is that you um, events like that or stunts events like that uh, can capture media attention mm -hmm. and public the public imagination those are harder to pull off in most other parts of the world right um, yeah let's go to a part of the world like uh, North Africa yeah. Middle East <laughs> uh, an area you know well um, I think there was a moment where many people were excited about the possibility of social media and information infrastructure and changing political mm -hmm. life and uh, that excitement may have waned, yeah, in the last three or four years? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it really, you know, it differs by country, but I think if I, we pick, okay, if we're talking about North Africa, the, I, would, I would go with three out of five that I know about reasonably, uh, mm -hmm. Morocco, Tunisia, and Egypt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's, Tunisia, it's been um, really wonderful to watch. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not all roses, but there's been a lot of progress it's, there. Yeah. And, but I also see, you know, that a lot of people have still pulled back from social media, and I, I'm, mm. it's not clear to me why. Mm. Um, Morocco is a little bit different, and worth putting aside for now, just because of all the complexities of um, of a monarchy in this case. Um, but Egypt, in particular, I think is is probably the most interesting case that you had a decade, a decade's worth of activism, of mm. online, you know, online activism, blogging, um, sort of freedom of information activism, that sort of thing, and then this uprising happens and you know everybody suddenly comes together and you have all of these different people coming together across different groups that didn't agree with each other that were fighting for years um, and then as soon as it dies off um, I've, I've just watched so many people leave the country leave mm. activism leave social media um, and it does feel really hopeless mm -hmm. and I don't although I think it, in fairness they came together twice right they they actually tossed out a, a head of government twice Yes. Well, your part, so. well, sort of. I mean, it, d different groups, I would say. But different yeah. groups? Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, there was a, the, I would say that a lot of the people that were very much in support of the January 25th revolution mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. believe that the second one was a coup that was, um, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I'm of that, I'm of that okay. belief as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it, was, it seemed like different forces at work. Mm -hmm. It may have been genuine. I'm sure that there were genuine activists um, looking to overthrow Morsi. I, I don't deny that, mm -hmm. but... I do see sort of interference there. So would you say that's different forces using social media to organize in Tahrir Square and occupy a, a physical space that's important to collective identity, or, or, or was it fundamentally different people in the second time round? I would social say media wasn't part of the different. Um, wasn't part of the story. Yeah, I, I think that social media was much less part of the story the yeah, second time around. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I, you know, I mean, I, there is a lot of popular support for the coup, so it's mm -hmm. hard to, but it's, it, a coup is still a coup, still and a it was definitely right. engineered by the military. Um, there was social media involvement, and it's, it's interesting. I don't feel like anyone's done a good enough um, deep dive into that, but mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of it was sort of um, almost astroturfing by the military in some Astroturfing, way. but so that was going to be my ne next question. Yeah. It's, it's not that the military moved into a vacuum. They, right. They led the coup and set up an astroturf movement for the... Right, school. right, oh, okay. which, which right. probably did get quite a bit of popular support because there were lots of people that were fed up with Morsi, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, I mean, I think that they sort of walked right into a trap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Now it seems like you know things things do seem much worse, and I'm I'm sort of watching a little bit of mobilization happen again. Um, mm -hmm. One of our dear friends and sort of um, leaders in the in the revolution, Al Abdel Fattah, um, was just sentenced to five years in prison, and so um, and his sisters in prison. There are a number of a number of activists in prison as well. It's not just him, but because he's you know he's on the cover of the New York Times this mm -hmm. week, um, because he's so prominent, I think that this may lead to another mobilization of you know sort of that first type. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what that looks like, and I don't know what ability people even have to protest after um, after some of the recent events. Um, you mean they're uh, emotionally exhausted or afraid of the risks? Uh, no, there was the um, there there was a procession a few weeks ago um, in January where uh, a group was carrying um, flowers, um, mm -hmm. sort of honoring a previous uprising, and um, a young leftist activist was shot mm -hmm. uh, by police mm -hmm. um, while she was carrying a wreath of flowers, and mm -hmm. it was just really sort of emblematic of what this new regime is doing. Um, and so I think that yeah, there's there's definitely fear this time um, that didn't exist before of actual actual physical harm that mm -hmm. may not have seemed possible under Mubarak. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that social media has sort of lost its edge as a as one of the tools in an activist toolkit, or it's no longer as productive, or doesn't have to be as productive, or the counter force counter regime regimes use it just as well. I think that that's true. I mean, in this specific case, I would say that it's less about social media and more about um, people's attitudes and people's emotional states where they mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. And so social media is only only as strong as the people who use it. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you had enthusiasm and hope, um, you had a much stronger environment. Whereas now, without that hope, it's just, you know, mm -hmm. it's a place for people to share their thoughts and, and complain and, mm -hmm. and argue, but it doesn't have that same organizing ability if people's mindsets aren't mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. That said, I think you make a really good point that um, governments, including the Egyptian government, um, although to a lesser degree than certain others, have definitely ramped up what they're capable of. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's so interesting to see how much of it is sort of in admiration of the NSA. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of governments are using that as, look, the US does this, we can do it too. Right, that's the unfortunate consequence of the, yeah. Yeah, the exposure. One of the unfortunate one of the, consequences. One of the unfortunate <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It validates what other regimes that would yeah. think they want to be able to do. Um, may I take you back to Morocco and yes. possibly Jordan? Because sure. um, Tunisia and Egypt, uh, perhaps, um, Yemen and Libya might be examples of um, dictators that lost their lives, uh, jobs after the revolution. And um, Morocco and Jordan might be examples of regimes that survived, mm -hmm. but at least at the time had to go through some pretty significant um, cabinet reshuffles, government collapses, significant promises, um, buyouts, cash transfers, you know, a range of things. Yeah. Um, did those. Uh, the activists and did the Arab Spring fare better actually in those other countries, or did yeah. it also fizzle in terms of impact? It's funny because Jordan and Morocco are similar in so many ways. They both have young kings. They're both monarchies. Kings, that's right. um, they both made some positive changes uh, to prevent further uprising, mm. but um, they've gone in such different directions since then. So I mean, I think you know Morocco kind of does exist in a vacuum because it's so isolated from the rest of the Middle East and, and or the rest of the Arab world. I mean, especially, it's the, yeah, the borders closed like with Algeria, and so it feels much more close to Europe than right. it does to any other Arab country. <laughs> um, Morocco, though, they're, the uprising is small, and the king was so swift in introducing reforms that most people just said, okay, and went home. Mm -hmm. um, which isn't to say that there isn't a movement there, but it's, you know, it's, it's geographically different from a lot of Arab countries in that it has a number of major cities and mm -hmm. hubs mm -hmm. as opposed to one or two. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have a much more spread out movement, and you also have um, sort of economics are improving there, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people just are, are satisfied enough. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a horrible place to live, and, and in fact, I think Morocco's got a lot of bigger issues to tackle, you know, things like literacy. Their mm -hmm. literacy mm -hmm. rate is abhorrent. Mm -hmm. um, Jordan, on the other hand, is you know, developing quickly, has a high literacy rate, has all of these things, and there, you know, there were quick reforms, but then lots of backsliding since then. Mm -hmm. um, so the press and publications law of 2012 that resulted in the blocking mm -hmm. of more than 300 local news sites. Yes, yeah. um, you have uh, increased surveillance, um, but I think also there, part of the reason that there hasn't been another move of the uprising is I think that people are scared of 
what's happening in the countries around them. Mm. Um, yes. If you're that close to Syria, mm -hmm. you you don't want that to happen, especially not now. And they're also, you know, they're they're worried about their borders. I think that there's just a number of reasons that mm. people are sort of wary of trying to stir anything up right now. Mm -hmm. So how would how would you uh, if you had to? guess at the percentages of your time dedicated to certain types <laughs> of country. Do you spend most of your time thinking about democracies and what's going on in democracies, or most of your time thinking about what's going on in authoritarian regimes? And listening to you speak so nicely about these different countries makes me realize that there are um, governments learn from what each other oh, do. Or they, they, they copy each other's, they emulate each other's policies. And uh, it's not just that democracies emulate the democracies, right? They pick up tricks from what authoritarian regimes oh, do. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And there's so many authoritarian regimes that now pick up some of the tricks uh, from democracies. Is we just have to be vigilant with yeah. both type? Is, is that it's an interesting, I mean, I, yes, I think we do. It's an interesting question because I don't, I don't think about it that way. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't divide them into those types of countries. And mm -hmm. partly because when it comes to these issues, and particularly surveillance, it's not really a helpful division because democracies are, are doing much worse things mm -hmm. than, uh, the, sorry, in terms of the actual breadth of the surveillance. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that the consequences are the same. The consequences mm -hmm. in an authoritarian regime, uh, once that surveillance is captured and somebody is tracked down, are probably much more severe. Right. But the US is doing far more in terms of surveillance right. than but almost But the rule any. of law thing that you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier works a little better. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah but, but still, I mean, it, it's, so when, when I'm working, you know, solely on these issues, I mm -hmm. just don't find it to be a helpful dividing line because, you know, if you look at, for example, um, Lebanon, um, not really, a, not a democracy, not a dictatorship, somewhere, not really even a government sometimes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very confusing, Depends sort of the world's only living uh, anarchist state perhaps. Mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> um, but there, you know, you have, you generally have press freedom. Mm -hmm. There's very, you know, I would say that the consequences for people there who've transgressed red lines um, in the past, in the, hand, in the past handful of years, have been less severe than for people in the U.S. When you say transgress a red line, you mean a journalist that's gone too far? Yeah, typically even a blogger, I would say there. Oh, okay. um, there, the most likely retribution in Lebanon is not going to be from state actors. It's going to be from non-state actors, militias, okay. what have you. Right, right. So there's certainly a risk to being a journalist. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. ask you know some of these really brave journalists there that have, that have lost their limbs in car bombs, mm -hmm. things like that. It's mm -hmm. horrific. Um, but there's the state. In, in interference is less severe sometimes mm -hmm. than in certain democracies. And I find that, I find those complexities really interesting. Um, and that's why I find that dividing line. I mean, yes, absolutely the rule of law matters. And I, I, do, I do not think that the consequences of the NSA's surveillance have been fully um, uncovered yet. Mm -hmm. But I, I absolutely you know, see the difference, but I, I just don't find it to be that helpful of a dividing line sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right, especially since the government governments dabble in each other's techniques, and yeah. uh, you know, they blur the line. Yeah, so absolutely. Well, and just to add to that one thing, I mean, one one kind of emblematic example of this is in the current debate around export controls of surveillance technology. Mm -hmm. um, there's a debate, ha so the, the Vassanar Agreement that came out last year, um, put, and I'm not an expert on this topic, I've actually purposely you know, removed myself from it because right. I find it stressful. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but this, this agreement um, essentially would believe require states to adopt certain export limitations mm -hmm. on um, mostly targeted surveillance technology and intrusion mm -hmm. technologies. And in the US, and including with some of my colleagues, there's been some opposition to this. Um, fears that it will affect research, fears that it will affect um, speech, you know, on the principle that code is speech. Mm -hmm. And I understand those concerns. Um, and I think that this is a tricky one because you have to weigh whether um, the, the harm to individuals is worse than the harm to these other individuals mm -hmm. who might, you mm -hmm. know, whose research might be affected. Um, but the reason that this so one- So what's the research argument? Uh, that so the way that some of these regulations have been worded in the past mm -hmm. um, would potentially restrict um, people from doing research on recording interviews. Yeah, or, or, or um, like capturing malware for research stuff oh, like that. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the same way that, for example, like the Tarek Mahana case in the U.S. In the same way that mm -hmm. someone who translated Al Qaeda material is now in prison. Is now in prison. Got it. Um, it, it just these overbroad sorts of regulations mm -hmm. that kind of have unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. um, and so the reason that this one kind of relates to what you were saying is that the original iterations of this in the US called the um, Global Online Freedom Act or GOFA yeah. would have allowed 
basically, the, I think the Secretary of State to create a list of bad countries mm -hmm. to which the US, U.S. companies could not sell these technologies. Mm -hmm. And I find that to be, I mean, what are the, first off, what are the standards? What makes mm -hmm. a bad country? Is it what they use the, the um, surveilled material for? for? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then would we ever put Bahrain on that list? I mean, we sell them weapons, we mm -hmm. use them as a military base, and they're one of the worst offenders in this space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yet, I cannot imagine the US government saying, oh, you can't sell technology there. Mm -hmm. And so I find it to be this weird geopolitical quagmire of, you know, mm -hmm. I, I agree it's a quagmire, but there are um, there is some great research from Citizen Lab, right? Mm -hmm. Trace of, sort of the process tracing of how technologies leak across yes. uh, within the U.S. Uh, to lower levels of security services, right? Domestic police, and then mm -hmm. the same technologies leak across bo international borders to Pakistan. Yeah, well, and it speaking of, of information sharing and learning mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. governments, too, you have a local police going to countries like Israel to learn mm -hmm. some, some of these techniques. techniques and I right. find that to be fascinating, too, mm -hmm. that there's mm -hmm. this local element, local law enforcement element to it that we never really talk about. Mm -hmm. So one of the countries, big countries we haven't talked about so far would be China, and I'm not a China mm, expert. Nor am I, okay. <laughs> but I'm happy to talk about it. Well, uh, I was going to ask you then about how global civil society that's interested in um, information mm -hmm. policy should engage in China, because that's oh. the, you know, that's the enormous internet that's slightly different. Uh, you know, it's not quite an intranet, but almost. It's certainly different cultures of internet use and in policing. So is there any effect China? Uh, should there be? A China's really confusing because when you think about, okay, you know, Google pulled out, that's one thing. They had a fairly small market share. And they sort of pulled out. Yeah, they sort of pulled out. Um, but, you know, Facebook has been talking about whether or not they should go in. Hmm. The funny thing about that is that it's probably the only country in the world where Facebook would have serious competition from existing providers. Mm -hmm. And so they can't, like, Facebook would, would go in and maybe, I don't know, get the kind of market share that, um, uh, what was that funny one that Google owned years ago? Orkut. Orkut had like how Orkut, you know, right. you had it in Brazil and India, but right. it wasn't popular anywhere else. Mm. I imagine China, you'd have like some some place in China where this tool one catches or two on. Cities, right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I think that that's what's interesting about China. Like I was reading this article the other day, just a fun story about this guy who lost his iPhone um, mm. in New York, and it ended up uh, in China. So a lot of the stolen iPhones in the U.S. Mm -hmm. end up in the Chinese market, mm -hmm. um, and because his phone had never been disconnected from his, I don't have an iPhone, so I don't know the terms, um, but his stream, he was able to see the photos that this guy was taking. Nice. And then Chinese Weibo users tracked down the guy and like orchestrated a reunion mm. between the original phone owner and the new phone owner. And it was so interesting to see this entire other world mm. of internet where uh, I wouldn't, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to argue that this is a freedom, but mm. The fact is that China has done something that no other government trying to restrict the internet has done, which has created enough freedom and enough space for people in that country to connect with each other. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Iran, when it tries to restrict the internet, it tries to restrict Iranians from speaking to each other about anything, let right. alone politics. Mm -hmm. And so I don't agree with what China does, but I don't think that it's the worst model. And I find that, mm. I, I find that the the intense focus on it from the State Department for so many years mm -hmm. has been, you know, just really troubling because it's been at the expense of, I mean, you know, expense whether or not the, the you know, whether or not the U.S. government should be involved in any of this at all is another question, but, but yeah, it's been at the expense of countries that I think are doing much worse things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, I think the Chinese have also been um, very deliberate in terms of launching the companies that would compete with anything, yeah. that uh, any app generated in the West. So Facebook might f end up only in a few cities, but that's because there is a state built, presumably with lots of back doors mm -hmm. for the security services, equivalent. And same thing with um, QQ and Weibo, and yeah, Sina Weibo. So yeah, and also launching these things with the censorship from the outset, right. so that it's seamless. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's the uh, Saudi Arabia did that too to a certain degree, but then mm -hmm. they kept pushing, and that's caused they them problems. Them. I think that you know if if governments had been smart, not that I again I do mm. not wish that they had done this, but if governments had been smart, they would have done what China did and, and provided this all from the outset, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. so that people had no idea what they were missing. 
I don't know if that argument still holds water. I've heard that many times, mm. particularly from the sort of DC types in the US that, oh, mm. but the Chinese don't know what they're missing. And mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's what's fascinating to me as a social scientist. We don't know what the Chinese are missing mm -hmm. because we know there's tools for getting around the firewall and we know there's translation tools and we know there's there are things you can do from within China to experience the internet that we might wish we had, right? Um, but we don't know how many people actually do them or how many people know how to use the workarounds but choose not to. Right, right, and it we also don't know what, what matters to people. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's her, I, I think it's particularly horrendous when a government censors information about that country's history. Mm -hmm. So that, for me, is, is the most problematic aspect of, of mm -hmm. Chinese censorship, is that people can't even know what happened 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. But is it such a horrible thing that they're censoring, I don't know, for example, um, white supremacist sites. Mm. Um, I'm not, you know, again, I'm never in favor of censorship, but I also think of it, you know, I think the, the biggest issue with censorship is who controls it, um, and what does that mean when it when something is taken away? Mm -hmm. But if something never existed in your world in the first place, would my life be better if I didn't know that white nationalism was a thing? Probably. Mm -hmm. um, but but <laughs> so white nationalism, we can we also can identify the issues that we are pretty sure they censor on, right? Tiananmen and yes, Tibet. yeah, that was Tibet just sort of a. So those are the the and. Um, South China Seas. So there's a, we know the suite of issues that. Well, the but they also wrote. censor a lot of Western media in general, mm. um, and not specific. I mean, yes, because those that you know, the New York Times may have covered China or does cover China, but mm. that the rest of the New York Times is also censored, mm -hmm. and so you have you know this really broad censorship mm. that means yes, and I do think that the historical stuff is is really kind of at the crux of the, the issue. Crux of the issue. Whereas like. Is it important that you can't access the style section of the New York Times? Hmm. I'm, again, it's it's For a some tricky. People, maybe, yeah. yeah, it's it's sort of a tricky conversation to have because I never, you know, I hmm. never agree with censorship. But I think that China is such an interesting example of what what happens when you provide people with this entire space in which to interact, mm -hmm. um, and you're not taking something away. You're just never providing it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Seems to me there's a, another difference between the Saudi style and the Chinese style in that the the Saudis started from the outset actively involving their users in self-censorship, mm -hmm. right? Through the nomination of URLs that were had art, or uh, you know, art by gay people or mm -hmm. gay theme, queer themes, uh, art that was uh, offensive. Um, and I'm not sure that the Chinese did that to the same degree, right? It aren't the, isn't the culture of internet use in Saudi Arabia much more geared towards self protect cultural self protections and? Yeah. Less so for the Chinese. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I think that Saudi culture in general, you have this sort of um, policing of, e of the so, other. Right, right. You know, it, it exists in other spaces mm. too, in offline spaces. Um, you know, for example, people policing what other people are wearing. That that's a thing mm. that exists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I don't. Again, I don't know enough about China um, as a culture to to know you know whether that would work there, whether mm. that sort of model would work there. But I think it it fits with with other things happening mm. in Saudi Arabia. Um, yeah, I find that to be an interesting example too, because I think that um, in the Chinese context, it the Chinese context text. Ugh, there, I'm stuck on a word. Um, it's sort of broad. It affects everyone mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. in the same way. I wouldn't say everyone in the same way, but I think the the intent of the censorship. Whereas in Saudi, it's very much about restricting minority rights, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, from political minorities to religious minorities to Gen sexual minorities, gender, gender minorities. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think that that's, that's another thing that differentiates it. Although Saudi, I would say, is probably the close, it, it's a closer cousin to the Chinese model in the sense that um, they were one of the last countries to come online, in, or in the Arab world anyway, mm -hmm. uh, and did so with heavy censorship already in place. Mm -hmm. um, very few countries managed to right. do that. With, with a government bureaucracy, with paid staff who's tasked with censorship. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah so the, the first day that people were able to connect to the broader internet, as opposed to, say, like, um, email or academic mm -hmm. uh, intranets, um, already, you know, all of the sexual content was blocked. Mm -hmm. So they just never had access to it they in the never first had place. With you. Thank you. Well, uh, lots to do, right, for those of us who want to remove these blockages. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jillian. My guest today has been Jillian York from EFF. Thank you for today's conversation. Yeah, thank you for having me.